<clears throat> Good morning. Pastor Mark Driscoll here with Prepare the Way Ministries. Glad to be here with you spending some time in the Word of God. We are talking about dressing for battle, that the day we live in is a day to fight the good fight of faith. And uh, we as God's people are not called to just be spectators looking to be entertained, but we are soldiers of Christ. And we're called to fight the good fight of faith. That's what Paul said, I have finished the race. I have fought the fight. And he tells Timothy that to be strong is a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And we're called, we need to understand that what we're involved in, especially in our day today, is a spiritual conflict with uh, eternal um, uh, ramifications. That our battle is not about who gets to be in charge of the country. Our battle is in charge of who's in charge of our hearts. And and so we're fighting for the soul of our people. And, uh, and Christ has won that battle, but he calls us to share in that victory and to enter into it the way we live. I want to pray with you, and then we want to get into it. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your truth and for your strength. Now, God, I pray that you lead and direct me as I speak your word. I pray that it would be your word and not mine. There are a lot of things I could say that would be my own opinion and come out of my own flesh. And Lord, I don't want that to happen. I pray that you would just use me as a vessel and just say what you want to say, Lord God, to each of us. And Lord, we give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a little kid, um, one of the things I enjoyed doing uh, was uh, playing battle. Uh, you know, we would get our water guns or toy pistols and swords or uh, sometimes we'd just go out and find a stick out in the, in the ground and use it as a sword. We'd just get out and we'd pretend we were having these major, major battles and we would swing those swords and we even had a, an apple tree in the backyard. We'd get into a conflict where we're throwing apples at each other. The neighbors didn't like that too much. Sorry guys. And uh, we would just have these conflicts and it was always in that moment that battle felt so real as little kids, you know, and we had places we would go and we'd build forts in the woods and we, we would just, for that moment, that time, we were in a real war. And of course the time came when we realized uh, that that war was just pretend. It was just a game. It wasn't the real thing that we didn't know that as we grew up, we would be fighting real battles. Uh, we'd be fighting the, the against greater things. I think that sometimes Christian people are like children playing battle. Uh, they're, you know, Jesus said that you're like children in the marketplace playing funeral and playing wedding and saying, why aren't you dancing with us? Why aren't you singing with us to all the adults? Because they're just playing and having a good time. And he said this generation is just like that. They, they, they're playing at it. They're playing at the things they ought to be working at. And I think sometimes we play, we have these we think we're fighting the fight of faith when we're really just fighting our, for our own positions and our own preferences. And we have our own battles that we get involved in, but how many of our battles are the real battle that God has called us to? I think how many of us are in conflicts that have nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven? And, uh, you know, this election has been such a conflict, has it not? And, and there's still, even after the choice has been made, there's still conflict. There are people protesting and angry and hurt, and you know some are gloating and some are depressed, and it's it's just there. The, it's still out there. There's still that sense that that we we don't like each other very much. And but the thing is, is that uh, we we've been fighting this fight. In fact, uh, Christians all over fought in prayer uh, about this election. And uh, people praying and just believing, you know. But here's the thing that I, I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that if we, that we're just playing at it, that we think that if I can just get the right person in office, the battle is won. Many of us are breathing a sigh of relief. Oh, good, our candidate won. Now everything's going to be okay. Others are in depression and grief. Oh, no, we lost. Everything's going to be terrible. And it doesn't matter if it had been flipped. We, the other side, we'd both be doing the same thing on the other side. Because we've put so much, we've invested so much into this thing. And I'm not saying that wasn't important. Absolutely, there were some critical things at stake. And there still are some critical things at stake. And I think it was a very important... There's a reason this was so intense. 
And so, but there are spiritual ramifications in that behind this election, and here's where I want to get to. If you think that uh, everything's just fine or everything's lost because of the outcome of the election, you're missing the point. You're fighting the wrong fight because there's behind this conflict in our culture is an even greater conflict, the invisible war. There's something behind it. And I really believe in a lot of, to a lot of large degree, there was a conflict and is still between good and evil, between righteousness and unrighteousness, between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And I don't think the lines are as clearly drawn between the parties as we might want to believe. I think that there's some, that, that there's a blurring here because there's some, there's some dark and light in, on both sides of the aisle. And there's some, there's some, no. So however you think about that, my point is this, church, whatever you think about the election and how it turned out, our battle is much deeper than the outward appearance of things. Our battle is much deeper than the economy and what you think about it. Our battle is much deeper than the boundaries of our country and what you think about those. Even though those things are the result of the real battle, they're not the battle. You know, you know what I'm saying? I think that the, the questions we've been debating are big questions. They're important questions. But there are spiritual realities behind those that are the real fight, the real war. And I believe that you and I as Christians have got to remember that we've got to look beyond the surface of things. We can't let the media tell us what the fight is. We can't let uh, the president or the former president or the president to come tell us what the fight is. God in his word tells us what the fight is. And as a church, we've got to be focused on the real fight that there that is, is going on. That there is a battle between life and death, between light and darkness. Now, Christ has won the war by his death on the cross. It says he defeated the principalities and powers. That's spiritual forces. He defeated the forces of hell on the cross and in the resurrection. But you and I are, are still here in this area and this arena. And so we're still fighting from that victory. And there are still, there's territory to take. It's not geographical territory. It's spiritual territory. There are still things to accomplish. There are strongholds to take down. And they're not political they're spiritual. Now, like I said, everything in the physical realm can't has a root in the spiritual. And so they're, they're not totally separate. What I'm saying is don't think it's just about what you see. Don't think that the fight is settled by the things of this world. There's a root behind it. We're in a spiritual war. And so we've got to keep our mind on not thinking that, well, okay, now here's where some people are. Donald Trump is going to fix it all. And we're going to be the country we ought to be. Or Kamala was going to fix it all, and we messed up, and so we're not going to be what we ought to be, at least for another four years. And so, and, and there's where people are, and people are thinking, because this person's in office, it's going to be okay. Or because this person is not in office, it's not going to be okay. And so we've got this, what are we going to do? And I, uh, we've had people talk about keep the fight, the fight, the fight. But what fight are we keeping? What fight are we doing? As the church, we've got a deeper fight that's, that's more serious than the things you see in this world. It's a, sp a fight between the eternal destiny of, of people. Eternity is, in the, is, is at stake here. There are souls of men and women. Um, you know, a person can have a, 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 a good economy and a happy life on this earth and still lose their soul. Because the greatest needs are those needs that last forever. Doesn't mean we shouldn't care about the temporal needs. Absolutely. That's why I'm glad that we participate in the political process to try to make those kind of differences. But we've got to go deeper. There's more than just making sure everything out here is okay. We've got to look deep. Where, what is God calling us to? And what is the real fight here? We can be careful, we can be like I was as a little kid, fighting this little battle with my toy sword and just thinking, I've won the fight, I've won the fight. But at the end of the day, what have I done? When I got older, I had to say this to my shame, when I was a young adult, I wasted countless hours on my computer playing battle games. I love those kind of things. I don't play them anymore, I just don't have time. 
but I used to spend too many hours fighting imaginary battles on a computer screen when there were real battles to fight out in the world. And so there was a period where that, that was like, it would be so exciting because I would be fighting, I'd be winning, I'd be taking territory, I'd be doing all this stuff. And then I remember as I moved, got a little older, I started thinking, what have I really accomplished in this? What have I really done? Nothing. And many of us are fighting things that at the end of our life, we're going to come to it and it's going to be just like that. What have I really done? What did I really accomplish? I've, I've got to get into the what are the deep things here of God that, that are of eternal value. It's only the eternal things that are worth all of the energy that I have as a Christian. And so let's look at what Paul says about that. We're in Ephesians chapter 6. And what I want to challenge you to do today is don't, don't be misled into thinking that your fight is over because of temporary things that have been accomplished, that your your fight is bigger than that. For you know, let's just read, and then I'll, I'll I'll make more application. Let's start at the beginning, Ephesians chapter six, verse ten, and we're going to go down through verse twelve now. We've already talked about ten and eleven, but we're going to read it again. Paul is telling us to get ready for the battle, to dress for battle. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might, verse 10, telling us that the battle is dependent on the strength and power of God Almighty. It's not dependent on my strength. I don't, I don't do this in my strength. Everything is in his power and his strength. And then it says, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He says, look here, you've got to dress fully in the fullness of Jesus Christ. You can't have half of a Jesus, a Jesus of your preference, a Jesus of your convenience. You've got to have all of him. You've got to have, give all of you to all of him if you're going to win this thing, if you're going to walk in victory. Now, the next thing he says in verse 12, for we do not wrestle. Here's where we are today. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, what Paul is saying to us here, this is the point today. Don't be misled into thinking you're fighting the enemy when you're only fighting temporal things. He said we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The people we have to deal with, even those that oppose us, are not the real enemy. And I think that is so relevant today. This election one of the things that made this election so hard is that everybody made the other person the enemy. Donald Trump's the enemy of democracy. Kamala Harris is the enemy of democracy. Both parties said it. Both parties said that of each other. This person is the enemy of our country. And this, it's a typical uh, manipulative tactic that is often used in trying to do political stuff. It is, they are the enemy we're the good ones, they're the bad ones. All through history, one of the greatest tragedies of history is, the, is when that becomes the, the word. Those people over there are the bad people. We're the good people. So if the good people get rid of the bad people, then, then that's what the, the critical race theory is based on that concept. If the good people get rid of the bad people, communism is based on that concept. Good people get rid of the bad people. All the genocides that have ever been perpetuated, get, the good people get rid of the bad people. And our politi political process this year was get rid of the good, bad people and let's get on so the good people can make it. And the, 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 the delusion of that is that some people are inherently good and some people are inherently bad. Racism is built on that concept, that that race is the bad people, this race is the good people, and all of us have been guilty of that in our history. And so even if you could say, well, this race did it more than that, right? well, does it even matter? Look, evil is evil, no matter who's doing it. And so if I say, if I'm, I'm missing the fight here, if I think you are my problem, I'm missing the fight here if I think 
Kamala Harris is my problem. I'm missing the fight if I think Donald Trump is my problem. Now, we can be aware of the realities of what's going on in those people, but the real problem is what's behind that, right? There's something bigger. And the Crusades, one of the greatest blights on church history, was based on this. We're the good people. Those are the bad people. Let's make war and get rid of those bad people. But somebody needed to sit down and read Ephesians 6 to the Pope and say, wait a minute, we don't fight flesh and blood. We fight principalities and powers and spiritual forces of evil. Here's the thing. In your church, there may be a conflict going on. Let's, let's bring it home, okay? In your church, there may be a conflict going on because that one person is being really mean. That person is doing this. That person is doing that. And while that person may need to be dealt with, yes, sometimes you've got to deal with people. But here's the thing. If you think that person is the problem, you need to understand that person may be a symptom of a deeper problem. If you've got somebody in your church causing disunity, yes, you need to deal with that. The Bible tells us to deal with that. But there's a root behind that. There's something else behind that that's invisible, that's dark, it's demonic. That is the thing that really needs to be dealt with. Are you hearing my point? We don't wrestle flesh and blood. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't hold people accountable. It doesn't mean that we don't deal with things like crime, corruption, those kind. Of, of course we do, but we don't stop there. We don't think, oh, we solved the problem because we moved that person out of the way. There's a root of something that allowed that person to become the problem. There's something beyond, beneath that that we have to deal with. There are spiritual forces at work here. Listen, if you're in a marriage that's struggling, and you're, you think, you know, my spouse is the problem, and here's where a lot of divorces happen. Here's the, here's the mindset. If I could just get rid of that person and find me somebody else, I would have peace and be happy. Because you think that your spouse is the problem. Now, your spouse may be causing a problem. And whatever that is may need to be dealt with. But that's not the root of the problem. Because what will happen is if you take that, uh, you leave your spouse to get, I'm going to go find me somebody else. You will bring that spiritual baggage into your next relationship. And you will have the problem again. It'll just look different. If you've got a church that's having trouble and you leave that church because those people, they're just not going with God, and you go find another church, you're going to find that church isn't going with God either because what you meant by going with God is doing what you want. There's a spiritual reality in your own heart that's making you jump from church to church to church until you find somebody that's going to do what you want them to do. And so here's the thing. Uh, it, every church in America can't possibly be as wrong as you think they are, but, you know. And you're you're the one right person, isn't that? Spe aren't you special? And I've talked to people who say, you know, I just can't. I don't go to church because none of them want to go with God. What you really mean is they don't want to go with you. And so here's the thing. There's a spiritual problem, all right. There's an enemy, all right. And it's invisible, but it's not those people. It's the people might be creating a problem, but they're not a problem. They're not the problem. You know what I'm saying? People can be a problem, but people aren't the problem. The problem is that demonic reality behind them. Let me give you some, some examples from the scripture about spiritual realities. Uh, when, when Daniel was praying, he prayed for three weeks. He was so burdened for his people that he was literally sick at the conflict that was coming. And after three weeks of prayer, an angel showed up. And the angel says to Daniel, you can look this up, Daniel, I think it's chapter 9, Daniel, as soon as you had uttered that prayer, the word was sent. But for these last 21 days, I've been fighting against the prince of Persia. Who's the prince of Persia? It's not the video game. It's a demonic ruler authority that was over the kingdom of Persia. And Daniel's prayers were being hindered by this demonic ruler trying to stop the word of God from getting to Daniel. Now, I don't understand all of that. There's so much of that that I can't figure out and understand. And then the angel said, but Michael, the archangel, came and fought and helped me. And so now I'm here to answer your prayer. There's so much of that I don't understand. And, and you don't either. It raises all sorts of questions that we won't understand until we get to heaven. I get that. Spiritual realities are just way beyond our, e our easy 
understanding, aren't they? And so and while that causes so many questions, the reality is there are demonic forces that influence nations and that attack the prayers of God's people. And so that's one of the spiritual forces in heavenly places that Paul's writing about, that we fight those kind of things. There's another place in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 where Paul says in the late, latter days, people are going to give what are, are going to start teaching doctrines of demons and, and false teachers. And he said, where's the root of that? Doctrines of demons. The demonic forces are teaching false te If you're listening to a false teacher, that teacher has opened themselves up to a demonic lie and have begun to ingest that demonic lie and begun to speak that lie as truth. All false teaching is inspired demonically. It comes from the, the liar himself. And so when I, when I step away, when a preacher starts neglecting the word of God and they begin to pursue their own logic, their own ideology, their own way of thinking, then that leaves room for the devil to teach them all kind of crazy things. Cults are born because that one honest, sincere preacher put the word of God aside and began to listen to the lies coming through his own reason or her own reason and thinking, oh, you know what really makes sense. Oh, this is probably true. And that's why we have so much false teaching out there because people stopped listening to the word of God. They stopped spending time with God and they began to substitute the truth of God with their own ideas. Even if they use a Bible verse to back it up. Preacher, if you're using the Bible to back up your already preconceived notions instead of putting your notions to the side and asking the, what does the Bible have to say, you're headed for trouble because there's a spiritual war coming against you and the enemy is trying to deceive you and pervert you into thinking, you know, the Bible is just not reliable. You know, I, we don't interpret it right anyway and we probably just, you know, we're smart people. We can come up with better things. You know, the gospel's too offensive. Let's water it down a little bit. Let's make it easier to swallow. Guys, that's from the devil. That's from hell. Jesus never told us to water down the gospel to make it more palatable for our hearers. He said, this is the word of the Lord. He gave it to us. He never said, well, you know, if they're not listening, you might want to tweak it a little bit so they'll like it. Guys, that's from hell. That is from the devil himself. That is a doctrine of demons. And, and there are so many of those things happening. And that's one of those spiritual forces at work. So you have spiritual forces influencing government and hindering prayer. You have spiritual forces undermining sound biblical teaching and creating false truth. And then you have spiritual forces simply attacking the people of God. Jesus told Simon Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you turn, strengthen your brothers. He was talking spiritual warfare. He said, the devil's coming after you, Peter. He's trying to sift you like wheat. But how did Jesus deal with that? I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. Our primary weapon in spiritual warfare is prayer. The devil will attack spiritual leaders. How many have we seen fall just in the last year? Prominent spiritual leaders who have fallen because the enemy sifted them like wheat. Friend, are you praying for your pastor? Are you praying for me? Please pray for me. Pray for your pastor. Pray for anybody who preaches the gospel because the devil wants to attack spiritual leaders. You know, the devil wants to create false teaching. He wants to create division. And, and so uh, when Ananias and Sapphira perpetuated the first scam in the church, and they came along and basically lied to the church about money they were donating just so they could make themselves look good. And Peter looked at Ananias and said, Why has Satan so filled your heart that you would lie to the Holy Spirit? That was a spiritual thing. That was a spiritual fight. Ananias listened to the devil and the devil filled his heart and caused him to perpetuate this scam and lie to the Spirit and he lost his life. You know, the devil is real, ladies and gentlemen. Two of the biggest mistakes we make with the devil is that we either overemphasize the devil and everything becomes a demon, 
or we underemphasize the devil and oh he's just not out there he's just he's not even real the bible says that he prowls about like a roaring lion seeking somebody to devour jesus said the thief comes to steal kill and destroy but i've come that you might have life have, have it more abundantly there's a spiritual reality so what does all this mean what does all this mean what this means for me as a christian i've got to realize whatever conflict i'm looking at whether it's the nation or whether it's my church, whether it's my home, or whether it's in my own soul. I need to realize that that, that is a, has a spiritual root to it. There may be temporal symptoms that need to be dealt with, but there's a spiritual root that I need to trace back. If I'm filled with anxiety, I need to ask, why am I having anxiety? If I'm in constant conflict, with people, I need to say, Lord, what's going on in my heart? Do I need to repent? Do I need to believe in a different? What do I need to do spiritually? Listen, if my church is 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 pulling apart, if all I do is run around trying to get rid of the bad people and to help the good people, then and, and in some cases, you know, some people need to leave. The Bible tells us that it says those that cause division don't have anything to do with them. And that's true, but that doesn't solve the problem. That may solve a symptom. The problem is, why is there room for division in our church? Why are we allowing that kind of thing to happen? Because there's some spiritual reality that we need to deal with. Is there jealousy? We need to deal with that. Is there a hunger for power? We need to deal with that. Is there unbelief? We need to deal with that. You see, if I just take care of the tangible, but don't go deeper, then I'm missing the point. Let me give you an example, can I? Of, of a church at spiritual war that, that hit the root of it. Um, in Acts chapter 4, it's a, it's a great story. It has basically three parts. This, this uh, Acts chapter 4, let me just su summarize, and you can go back and read it in detail yourself. Acts chapter 4 begins with Peter and John uh, preaching to the people, and then they were arrested because they performed a miracle and gave credit to Jesus. And so there's this first, is their witness, is their first weapon that they used in the spiritual war. The, all the leaders of the Sanhedrin came and brought them before them and, and said, now you tell us who did this miracle. Now they knew what Peter and John were all about. They were trying to intimidate them. They were trying to you know, be all big and bad, and they had the whole family there, and all the big shots, and sitting around, and you got these two poor guys dressed in rags, and standing in chains, and they think, we're going to intimidate these guys, and we're going to get them to just break, and Peter, it says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, bore witness to Jesus, he said, look, if you're mad at us for healing a lame man, let me tell you, not only did we heal a lame man, but we did it in the name of Jesus. And if you're not mad about that, let me make you even more mad. There is no name under heaven that we're by which you can be saved except the name of Jesus. He's the stone you builders rejected. Man, Peter's being bold. He's being courageous. He's living in the power of the Spirit, and he's declaring God's word boldly. He's not trying to justify himself. He's not trying to pick politic his way out of it. He's not trying to say... Oh, well, you know, guys, we didn't mean to offend y'all. We're sorry. Um, you know, let's all just try to think. I'll, I'll try to preach a better, more relevant message. Um, you know, I'm just really sorry for being, you know, I didn't mean to cause all that. No, 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 no. Peter said boldly and clearly, you want to know who did this miracle? Jesus did it. You know who Jesus is? He's the guy you killed on the cross and that God rose from the dead. Not only that, you can't be saved unless you trust in him. And it says when they saw, and I love what it says, it says when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized they had been with Jesus. You know, these guys had been with Jesus and they could see him all over him. And so these guys couldn't do anything with them. They just threatened them and let them go. Now that's step one, bold witness. One of the great weapons of our warfare is bold witness that they fought the real enemy. The real enemy was not the high priest and his big shot family. The real enemy was the, the anti-gospel spirit, the lie from the devil that tries to intimidate 
the people of God. And the cure for that was boldness. You know one of the best ways to do spiritual warfare is to do the exact opposite of what the devil's calling for. When the devil was calling for shame and fear, they did exactly the opposite. They said, oh no, no sir, we're not, we're not giving into that spiritual attack. We're going to speak the word boldly and buddy, they just nailed it. And, and so, you know, we need more preachers and churches that will fight the good fight of truth, not by slander, not by trying to politic your way out of it, not try, by trying to, to cozy up to the devil and make him like you and invite him to church, but to declare the truth of God boldly. Listen, church, when they tell you that you need to water down your gospel, I'm going to tell you, you need to, you need to spike it up. When they tell you you need to tone it down, you need to turn up the volume. You need to be the exact opposite of what the world is calling for. That's a spiritual war. Because the spiritual battle is those forces of evil that are trying to hinder the word of God. Trying to pervert the truth of God. And trying to tear down the people of God. That's the force behind it. Now Peter could have tried to just make, uh, make nice with those leaders. But instead... He said, that's not my enemy. Those people are not my enemy. My enemy is that lie of the devil that's behind them, and I'm going to attack that with the bold preaching of the word. The second part, the second part of spiritual warfare, this church, they got together to pray. The next section, I'm going to read this part. It's shorter and it's powerful. Listen to this. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God. And let me just say, they prayed. They said, oh, sovereign God, you see what they're doing. Your word says that you laugh at the rulers and you've got this. Now, God, give us boldness. And it says he filled them with the Holy Spirit. The building itself shook. And they went out and preached the word boldly. But they did it through united corporate prayer. They knew that the battle was not the political. They knew the battle was not even religious. The battle was against those who would stop the truth of God. That The battle was against the lies of the devil. The battle was against the spirit of fear. And they, what's the opposite of fear? is boldness. What's the opposite of cowardice? Boldness. They said, God, give us boldness. They didn't say, God, please help us to be more um, culturally contextualized. No, they said, no, make us bold and help us to ramp it up and speak your word. And God, while you're at it, please do some miracles. Show off. Show who you are. You see, their prayer was bold. Their prayer was powerful. Their prayer was united. Friend, if you want to win the war in this country, if you want to do it, you're going to do it through the bold proclamation of the gospel and through the powerful prayers of God's people. That's how we win the fight. Because the real fight is not Trump or Kamala, Democrat or Republican. The real fight is not conservative against liberal. The real fight is are we going to honor the Lord Jesus Christ or are we going to pursue the things of this world? Are we going to honor him or are we going to forsake him? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. It's the soul of this country that's on the line here. And I'm going to tell you, there are people on the right and on the left who love God with all their heart. You've got people who voted against you who love Jesus as much as you do. And they've got a different perspective on how that, and, and, and they may be wrong about some things, and that, we could debate all that. My point is, those people are not your enemy. Donald Trump's not your enemy. Kamala Harris is not your enemy. The Democrats, you know, they're not your enemy. The enemy is those spiritual lies that the devil is trying to vomit out on this country. The lies that life doesn't matter. The lies that God doesn't matter. The lies that justice doesn't matter. The lies that some people are okay and some people are not okay. That some people are image of God and some people are not. That, that, that some people deserve dignity and some don't. Different kind of lies. The lies that morality is just a word and it doesn't really matter what you do with that. The, the lie that you can't know what a male is and a female is. The lie that you can, you can change who you are and still bring glory to God. The lie that you can throw away the word of God and, and just create your own truth. These things are the spiritual things that are attacking our people. And that changes by the proclamation of the gospel and the bold prayers of God's people. But there's one more part. At the end of the chapter, it says... Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any things belonged to him were his own, but they had everything in common. 
And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. The church community, the community of the believers, loving each other, doing the work of God together as one, standing together as a community of faith. One of the big lies the devil is trying to perpetuate is that you don't need the church. The church is dead. The church is gone. They are misguided and you're not. Aren't you the great one? You're the one that has the truth. Your church is terrible. Get out of the church. He wants to pull the church apart because the thing that's the only thing that scares him as much as the bold preaching of the gospel and the powerful prayers of God's people is the bold community of faith living out the love of God together, taking care of everybody's needs, preaching the gospel, loving their neighbor, standing up for what is right, being a holy people together unto God. Those are three things the devil is scared of. He's scared of the gospel, he's scared of prayer, and he's scared of the church. And he wants. He, that's why he fights those three. So the weapons of our warfare that we're going to get into, how do we... How do we hold on to those things? Friends, don't fight the wrong enemy. Don't spend your life thinking that people are your problem. People bring problems. People create problems. But there's a bigger problem. And that problem is defeated by the proclamation of the gospel, the prayers of God's people, and the fellowship of his saints. And so when we come together in that way, we fight the right fight. I want to challenge us. There is a fight in our world today. But it's a, it's a fight that's deeper than this world even realizes. And that fight is by God's people fighting with faith, hope, and love. We don't fight like the world fights. We don't pursue it like the world pursues it. We pursue it according to the word of God and prayer. That's how we fight. That's how we win. And, and the Lord has already won the war on the cross. The Bible says, you know, that he... he uh, defeated all the principalities and powers what great news what great news so if he's done that then we fight from victory not for victory god's already won it at the end of the day when it's all over god's kingdom will reign forever and ever and ever and those who trust in him will share in that kingdom forever and ever and ever are you part of god's kingdom are you on the winning side the winning side is the side of the lord jesus christ and his kingdom are you on that side? Repent of your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for you. He rose from the dead. He's calling you to follow him. He's the way of life. He's the way of hope. He's the way of peace and justice and righteousness. His way is the way. And following Christ, follow him. He's calling you today to turn and trust him. Do you know him as Savior and Lord? Are you following his way? And Christian, are you engaged in the right fight? Are you engaged in the right fight? Let's stop shadow boxing. Let's stop playing children's games. And let's get after the real fight for the soul of the people around us. Parents, if you fight all your life so your kid can get a scholarship to go to college, but you don't fight for their soul, you're only fighting part of the fight. If you only fight for your children to have a nice career and a nice family, but you don't fight for them to know God and to grow in faith, you're fighting the wrong fight. The Bible tells us to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If you're fighting for your, your career to be successful, to make lots of money, but you're not fighting to bring the kingdom of God into your workplace, you're fighting the wrong fight. If you're fighting for this country to have a great economy, secure borders, and, and a great social life, and, and all those kind of things that are so important, I don't want to diminish those. But you don't care about the eternal destiny of the people that live here. Then you're fighting the wrong fight. Let's push deeper. If we're going to fight, let's don't stop praying for this country. I, I think a lot of people after the election felt like the battle was won, and so they stopped praying. Others felt like the battle was lost, and they stopped praying. I want to say, if you're praying for this country, don't stop. We need prayer. We need revival. We need spiritual awakening. We need a turn, not to a party or a system of thought, but to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be on the right side politically and still miss eternity. You can be on the right side of history and still miss eternity. 
Listen, it's not about being on right in terms of this world. It's right in terms of the kingdom. Who, who's approving are you looking for? Am I looking for the approval of the people I respect? Or am I looking for the approval of the one who died for me and rose again? Paul said this. I'll wrap up with this. Who am I, servant of Christ or this world? If I seek to please people, then I am not a servant of Jesus Christ. Give up pleasing people and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll teach you to love people. You won't serve them all. You won't, I mean, you won't please them all. You won't make them all happy, but you'll love them all because you love him. Seek his love and his peace, his power, his kingdom first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. God bless you. Go in peace.